The shooting of an unarmed man in Philadelphia is raising new questions about police conduct. He shot an innocent man because he was begging for a quarter. Our citizens are being hurt by the police. I still see it in my mind and I hear the people screaming and, and the terror in their voice because of how afraid they were. These are the true colors of these police officers. The things that has happened in the dark is now becoming to the light. We were being policed instead of, you know, being protected. Several hundred Philadelphia police officers now still facing that backlash. If the power is with the people, then these types of things won't keep occurring over and over and over. How's everybody doing today? Uh, Malcolm Jenkins, uh, safety for the Philadelphia Eagles, also co-founder uh, of the Players Coalition. I appreciate everybody for joining us this evening. Um, in 1947, in the midst of great uh, racial unrest in the country, Langston Hughes wrote uh, the poem, Who But the Lord? And in the final uh, words of that poem, he said, being poor and black, I have no weapon to strike back, but who but the Lord can protect me? Here we are in 2019, still looking for ways to fight back. But what we do know is that we can use our voices and our votes. And so the purpose of tonight is to allow the community uh, to be heard and to make sure that uh, what we want gets out to um, the mayor and we see the changes that we want to see in policing uh, here in, in, in Philadelphia. We're at a critical juncture here in Philadelphia. There's no question that trust between our police department and our communities is frayed. Just last week, a top police commander was indicted for sexually assaulting people who work for him. Over 300 police officers made racist, sexist, or racist and sexist social media posts. Uh, officers have been accused of corruption and have committed acts of serious abuse. Black people are stopped and searched far more than any other, any, anyone else in the city. And meanwhile, the majority of cases involving gun violence remain unsolved. This is not a, a knock or an indictment on the entire department. We all know that there are tons of officers that want to make our communities safer. But the next police commissioner that is appointed by the mayor will need to transform the culture of the police department in order to gain the trust of the community. So today we'll hear from a variety of speakers that will weigh in on what we think uh, Philadelphia needs to change in its policing practices. And in between each panel, we'll open up uh, to questions from the audience uh, to get your voices heard. Um, even if you don't, we don't get to your question, uh, make sure that you continue to ask on social media um, and continue to, to use your voice. Uh, you can hashtag hear Philly speak and we'll make sure that we get all of your questions and concerns directly to the mayor. Mayor Kenny wishes he could be here today, but unfortunately had um, a previous engagement out of town. So uh, I hope you enjoy the evening, uh, and thank you for being here. So uh, this first panel, my first two guests, um, really don't need an introduction, but I'll try anyway. We have Reverend Leslie Callahan, the first female pastor at the 119-year-old St. Paul's Baptist Church in North Philadelphia, and a leader here in the fight for police reform. And we also have Meek Mill, hip-hop recording artist and criminal justice reform advocate. All right, so the first uh, question uh, I'll pose to uh, Reverend Callahan. Uh, you're a leader uh, of the coalition fighting for an accountable police commissioner in Philadelphia. Can you take us through some of uh, the, the bigger issues? Uh, what, what do you think the biggest issues are uh, when it comes to policing in Philadelphia right now? Hi, everybody. Let me say a word of thanks for the invitation. Um, from the Players Coalition and for, from you, Malcolm. I am here as a representative of um, a faith-based um, orga grassroots organizing group um, that is interfaith, 
um, and that is concerned about how our next police commissioner interacts with people in the community. Um, you've already laid out all of the issues uh, that are of concern to us. We're concerned with uh, the way that policing um, still operates in an unconstitutional fashion as it relates to stop and frisk. Um, we're concerned about the way that the diversion of interest and uh, human power to stop people who are minding their own business means that that same human power is not available to actually solve crime. Um, we're concerned about the relationship between the police and the neighborhood, particularly when they make an error and the ways in which um, the top brass is frequently unaccountable. Um, and if the people at the top, including whoever the future commissioner is, if they are unaccountable, then the people who do the policing on the streets are also going to be unaccountable. And we see this not only as a civic and a policy issue, we see it as a moral issue. Um, justice, for all of our faith traditions, is at the center. And policing in the United States has never been just. It's always been inadequately um, taking care of the people who were supposed to be protected and served, and too often targeting people based on color and class. And so we feel like we have a moral obligation to call upon the mayor when he considers who to appoint to the position of commissioner, to appoint someone who is actually going to be more committed to justice, uh, more committed to protecting and serving the public in ways that are demonstrable, that are based on um, 21st century policing strategies that do justice. Yeah, I think that people ask me the same thing. What's the, what's the number one thing you want to see change? And, and it's, it's hard to point out one thing. I think it's, what we want to see is a commissioner that comes in with the idea that there needs to be a radical change in the culture of policing in, in, in Philadelphia. It's not just one practice or, or you know, training or this, it's a an, it's an complete culture shift. And I think um, and that's one thing that, that that's all, that's why we're here is to learn about these different things and obviously um, push that directly to the mayor. But Meek, do you have anything to add to that? If you had, you know, what's the, the main thing you wanna see change uh, me, I don't, I don't have a solution to it. I would say just an understanding of our community and what's going on. Uh, really, I think sometimes they have people policing our communities that have no understanding of what's going on in communities. You might see four guys standing on a step. Like it was times, you know me, I've been out of uh, these type of environments probably for the last 10 years out of it fully. But, you know, I come back and visit my family. Uh, when I was in it, it used to be sometimes they could pull up on you and tell you move off your own step. And you know we was the influential people in my block. Or it could be it could be so many. It's so many different levels to address it. If you look at it, you know you have a lot of gun violence in Philadelphia. If I was to come out of what I was doing as a rapper and came back to Philadelphia and was sitting around these kids and going back and forth with them and trying to bring a solution to their problems. Nine times out of 10, I'd probably be tied up in a gang affiliation for trying to help and use my voice and help out. So the best thing I would do is stay far because we don't have an understanding of what you can do. If you are a guy that just came home from prison and you want to give back to your community and you want to give back to society, you don't even know how close you could be to these guys and help out with a situation. So I would say like an understanding of our community and uh, just... Uh, there's so many different levels. I can't even put it in one word. Yeah. I, if I tried to do that, I, would, I wouldn't be making sense right now. So one of the things that I think is interesting about um, your case in particular is that I think everybody's familiar with, and, and you've really taken on the idea of parole and, and community supervision as kind of the center point of your advocacy, um, and everybody's familiar with your story and the technical violations that you know, allow them to keep you incarcerated or under supervision for you know, forever, it seems like. Um, but the other side of the coin that we don't talk about as much or people don't know as, as much is, is how the police played a role in your case and, and the abuse and misconduct, not only physical, but also uh, throughout testimony. So um, can you elaborate just kind of on that side of your uh, story? I always tell people, I always say it's, it's different layers to it. Like even if you've seen my documentary or if you hear me speak on my case, 
You might hear me speak about my face in a mugshot for 30 seconds. But you know, it's a big deal to be beat by police officers. But in my world, it wasn't a big deal. So you know, you might hear me talk about the story. Uh, my face got stitches, uh, next. But a cop lied and said I pointed a gun at him. So you know, I, now that situation of me getting beat down and knocked unconscious, it's small compared to what I have to talk about now. I'm fighting for my life, my freedom. A cop said I pointed a gun at him. Uh, I was knocked out a bunch of times. I'm, I'm cased up. I don't have any lawyer money. And uh, that was my future. The rest of my life, I was caught up in a system. And I was, great, I was grateful enough to have a drive to push me through. But along the way, I was in the prisons and, and in probation offices. And, jails with other guys who wasn't strong enough that I know would be trapped inside the system forever. Me, I know this is a conversation uh, between like the community and police, but me, I try to like narrow it down to everything in one because the system is, is like a, a big monster and you know it has is, is so many different uh, layers to it and you can't address all at one time. So you know I try to address the system at one because it's, it's so many different layers. And, uh, me, myself, I wanted to use my situation and take it and turn it into uh, a platform where I could give people, uh, uh, use my story to share light. And you know, like when I tell my story, it's always, I was beat up by the cops five seconds and go right past that. No, we take it back and we want to know why did that happen. And, and me, uh, I can't even make it a race issue. It was actually uh, all African-American cops that put their hands on me, myself. and. Uh, me, I would want to get an understanding of why things that like that happen. Why, I, me, I actually did get locked up with a firearm uh, in this room. Uh, that was my situation. That was the environment I'm in. If you're from Philadelphia, you living in it every day, not center city, but the outskirts of Philadelphia. We just had four kids shot in this area in the last month. Uh, I made a mind, mind as an 18-year-old. I decided to carry a firearm, but carrying a firearm led me to 36 charges, and the only thing I did was carry a firearm. And me, I always, in the back of my mind, wanted to get a grip on how a kid could go in for one charge and leave out with 45 charges. You understand? Yeah, and I think, or, and I'd ask you know, Reverend Callahan, do you think situations like Meeks are, are isolated? where these are a couple bad actors, or are these symptoms of a you know, larger, more widespread issue? I, I, I don't know how you could have that many coincidences. Um, I, I, I just don't, I, you know. Here's, I think, and here's the challenge from my perspective for people who say, you know, a few bad apples, a few bad actors, is that you could close your eyes and put your finger on any city. Quite frankly, it didn't even have to be a large city like Philadelphia. You could put your finger on any city in the United States, any police department in the United States. At some point, the apples are growing on a tree. And it, at some point, it's got to be, you, we have to look at what's going on with the tree um, I think it was Jesus who said that you can tell a tree by its fruit. And so in, I know it was Jesus. I was just, <laughs> um, but so at some point, if you keep seeing this fruit and there are these consistent tendencies, then we have to begin to look at what's going on with the tree. And on top of that, um, it, it's a systemic problem. Um, we're watching the news and every day we're seeing um, criminality at the highest levels of the United States government, right in our faces. Yeah, I did it. It's 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 illegal. Yeah, I did it, and people keep moving. And yet, the situation you describe, you got one legit charge, yeah. but it's like compounding charges. Yeah. It's exactly the opposite. It's upside down. And I don't, I don't, I'm with you. I don't know exactly what we do about it. I don't know entirely what we do about it. But I'm becoming more and more persuaded that the, that the very idea of what's legal and what's not is itself tainted. That's the bad tree. Um, and, and policing is part of it. Um, and the courts are part of it. And the society is part of it. We're part. We're all. We're all implicated. Like our first. Anybody does anything, we like. They should go to jail. Like, okay. Like we want our little kids to do stuff, and 
we're taking our kids to get scared straight, yeah. um, traumatizing them. They're little kids. So it's a, I think it's a tree problem. Can I say one thing too? Uh, if uh, I threw a show, 10 shows this year, and, and 10 kids got shot at my show this year, even if I didn't have nothing to do with that show personally, I think I would be held accountable for that show. And you know, uh, not saying all cops are bad cops, but in anything you have bad. And yeah, no, I don't, I don't think all cops are bad cops. You know, you gotta, it's a lot. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot. I got family that's cops that's honorable, that do their job and go home. I, uh, actually, some security work for me. It's cities we go in where some people can't hire, can't carry firearms, so we had to hire off-duty police officers. And, you know, we, 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 we do uh, background checks and character checks and find out what you're about. But, you know, everybody not good at anything. All rappers are not good. Uh, I'm not an angel myself. I've never been an angel. I've never been labeled as an angel. Uh, I'm a person with good morals. I'm a good soul. I don't want to kill a cop. I never had that type of mind frame to pull a gun out or point a gun at a police officer. Even though I had to wear that all them years, man, found guilty of that. And uh, I just think accountability. If people was getting shot at my shows, and every time I go to that show and it had nothing to do with me, I would still be a part of the cause why people are getting shot at these shows and losing their lives. Yeah, no doubt. I think, um, you know, we, I think we all alluded to this being a little bit bigger than just the police. It's, it's, it's a whole systemic issue, right? It's the criminal justice system, the courts, the police. But I think when we look at the system, the police are the front line of that. That's the first encounter that is going to take us. They're the gateway into the system, and then it's a cycle from there. And so when you look at the relationship between our communities and, and police, that's really, like I said, that, that entryway um, into how the state interacts with the, with the community. And so we look at uh, some of the posts and, and tweets that uh, the officers made. Uh, we had 300 officers make different quotes. Um, I'm not sure what they have behind us right now, but uh, what, what did uh, you think of? <laughs> can I tell you, that's what it looked like when I tell you about uh, somebody carrying a firearm. That's what violence looked like when you know you live in one of those type areas. So you know, it's, 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 more, it's, it's even more than just the police, you know? Uh, people actually are doing those killings. There's so many layers to what we gotta do just as people and as a culture just to take a step up. Even me, like, I, like, I love talking about these situations, just, but I just be like, what's next after talking? Like, if I go outside and get pulled over in a tenant car, will I be safe after having this conversation or would it matter? And I probably would be safe because I'm a rapper and I'm Meek Mill and it, uh, people know I have a, a foundation, but the normal black kid riding down the street, will he be safe during a pullover? No. I never felt safe during a pullover. I've been getting pulled over in Philadelphia my whole life. Uh, if, if you uh, come from like one of the urban communities here, if you, if you feel unsafe being pulled over by a police car, could you raise your hand? Right here. And don't raise your hand just to raise your hand. Like you have to really tr truly feel that in your heart. And me, I don't raise my hand no more. When I'm in Philadelphia now, I get pulled over. Police know who I am and I'm, I'm not committing any crime, but they know me by face now and, and, and they can identify me. And I don't feel that fear anymore because I feel like I had a foundation and I'm valued at that level, but up to the, f the further years of my life, I never felt that value coming up as a black man in America. I never felt that value, and I, I, I may not have ran across that police officer, but I never felt that in my heart since I have been growing up in the streets of Philadelphia. Yeah, well, I think history, part of it is, you know, we know our own history, you know, regardless of what is put on TV or what is shown, we know the history between black communities or communities of color and the police. We grow up, we, I remember my mom talking to me about going out and her being concerned and staying up until I walked back in the door because she don't know what can happen. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the environments that, I was, that she was worried about, it was more so having interactions with the police. Yeah. Um, and I think when we start to look at how we change or go start to go about changing those things, I think this is a great opportunity, which is why we're all here. And we want you to, like you said, how do we stop, how do we go beyond just these conversations about policing? Because we all know what we feel when we get pulled over or when we see images of police brutality, all these things. But forums like tonight, we want you to participate and to make sure when opportunities like this happen, when uh, the police commissioner steps down 
and the mayor saying he wants to hear from the public on what they want in the new commissioner, this is the time where we need to use our voices the loudest and make sure that we hold him accountable to what we want and that this new person is somebody who's going to come in and make a cultural shift um, because you have like these instances. So back to the, uh, the social media things, what, what, were you, what were your thoughts when you saw that report come out and do you feel like the response um, was strong enough? So I, I will say my own personal response to it was if there are this many people who are doing this basically in public, how many people are smarter than to put it on their own social media, right? So on the one hand, I mean, it was a lot of people. Um, but it, for me, it was more like, whoa, if you got this many people who are willing to say it in, in, in a basically public forum, how many more people are sort of saying it to one another um, and not necessarily in that forum? Um, that's worrisome to me. Uh, the other worry that I have is about driving it underground where we can't see it. Right. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, one of the things I want to say, I think that's related to this, is that um, one of the benefits of being in um, grassroots organizing is that you can make connections with people um, not only across the city, across the state, but across the nation. And there are folks who are really, there are lots of people who are trying to think about what are the, what are the processes that would have, allow us to have better policing. And in fact, um, I talked to a, a brother named Mike McBride, who's from Oakland, um, and one of the things that they've been talking about is focusing on hiring. Um, what are the criteria for who gets hired into the force? Um, equipment, like why are all these police forces, why do they have tanks in the city streets? What, what's happening with body cams? Um, everybody wants to talk about accountability. Citizen review boards that actually have some teeth that, that have to be listen to um, so that some accountability happens and the police are not policing themselves all of the time. Um, and, then, and then finally training for people who are already in the force um, as a first line of disciplinary action uh, for, for minor infractions. Um, but also to try to, like, can we get ahead of some of this? Too much of the time we're trying to catch up after some terrible thing has already happened? Is there a way for people who aren't trying to be bad actors? Um, is there a way to get to them? Because I think we can acknowledge, I, I agree with you that like on an individual basis, a person can be a good person, but if you bring a person who's a good person in a bad, into a bad culture, then what happens is that person, as they try to be a good person, they get punished in that bad culture. They get, they pay the price in that bad cult culture. And so it doesn't, you, you gotta figure out, we have to figure out how to get ahead of it to change the culture. So it, we, at least we can test this theory about there are good people who are just trying to do a good thing. Like, uh, uh, and I, I would like to shout out the one person I said I never felt that. It was a, a, a police officer in my know it, Tyrone Crowley. Uh, Basically, he, he used to run the power center in my hood and everybody in my neighborhood had a relationship with him. It wasn't nothing that he couldn't walk outside them doors and do, from the guys on the corner to the people, uh, the old ladies on their steps. He basically had his hand on anything he, he, he wanted to in my neighborhood. He could touch anything. He could make anything stop or go in my neighborhood because uh, he had an understanding of what was going on in my neighborhood. Me, my father was there since I was five years old. A lot of the kids in there was... Their father's been gone their whole lives. We had a power center. We had a place to go from 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night. Uh, Miss Ruth is right here. Shout out to Miss Ruth. She one of the people. Uh, I was in her program probably from third grade to sixth grade. I had somewhere to go. Now it's, I ain't been back. I'm not that, I, I don't know what type of programs they have deep in our neighborhoods, but you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and we'll help your program too. I see your program, you're always doing it. We'll make sure we hold you down too. But we ain't have that, nobody don't have that. And you know, we had, we had a cop in our neighborhood that could relate to us, that built with us, that ain't sent us to jail for any single thing. You do wrong, you get wrong. If you, you play right, you get right, you know what I'm saying? If you're a criminal, you, you know jail come along with that. If you're not, you know, you, 
you might still land in jail sometimes, but uh, you know, you should get your way. And, and that was just an example. Basically, uh, if anybody from the North Philly area, Birch, Caesar B. Moore, you know Tyrone Crawley. Uh, and if you came to him for anything, he had his hands so deep in my neighborhood. He was like a father figure to some of the kids, you know? And I think uh, programs and the understanding and uh, we have a job to do ourselves to bridge this gap and, and just make it work. No, I think that's a good point uh, or a great example of like how it can work. But the next question, I guess, would be, do you think that there, when there is so much distrust between the community and the police department or there's this kind of reputation for a department, do you think that that has an effect um, on um, public safety, like for instance, they showed that map and we're talking about how gun violence and homicides are on a rise right now in Philadelphia. That's where we want the focus, you know, for our officers to, to, to be on. We want them to be able to solve those, but they're only doing that at about, they only make an arrest about 44% of the time. But if I was in Philly, if I came back to Philly and I had to live in a, 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 a bad environment where a lot of violence was happening and this is not my situation and you got people being killed around my way every day, I would think criminal to get a firearm because I would think to protect myself because my neighborhood and I safe. If I don't think I could walk to the store without being killed because 10 people was killed in my neighborhood in the last two weeks, it's not safe. So criminality, the, 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 the crime rate will go up. It's not safe in the area. If I don't think I could walk 10 steps without losing my life, you don't think uh, I might pull this trigger a little fast and shoot a little kid or shoot somebody scared for my life because this area is not safe. There's going to be a lot of violence. There's going to be a lot of things happening because these things not safe. Me, when I'm, if I was in Miami and it was time to go to the club tonight, me, I would go to the club. A rapper job is dangerous. You know, you, we lose our lives, we get shot at. I would go to the club. But now you tell me that I want to go to the club here, you know why? Nine times out of 10, I wouldn't go. When you come outside, it ain't no police outside. So what we got to turn to our friends that got gun lights. You got to survive just to stay alive. So if it ain't safe, me, I, 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 have, I have money, I got, I got resources, I got a backing. So, you know, I don't have to resort to criminality, but I know I come from that life. I'm not that far away. I know a person, if you don't feel like you're safe and you're living in a place, this is what it's going to be. So, you know, I think we're going to have to uh, understand it. Y'all know the hot zones where I, I be out of town nine times, nine months out of the year. I know where they shooting at in Philly every day. I know where blocks don't ride down with no tenant windows. I know where the crime area is at. So, you know, we got to get an understanding in. Uh, I think come together and, and, and really put this thing to the forefront because, you know, I see a lot. Uh, we got, like, two-year-old girls and stuff getting shot in the head. All right, if the cops, you know, we come from every place has a cold. Uh, the union got a cold. Police got a cold. The streets has a cold. If y'all want the police to handle it, who going to handle these guys shooting little girls in the head around our way? Somebody going to do something about it or make these guys move out of our neighborhood? So it has to be some type of bridge that got to be gapped amongst whatever our community's built and the, the relationship between the police, it gotta be bridged. Uh, if it's not gonna bridge, it'll forever be separated. And I don't think anything could be done about it until uh, both sides step up. And you know, we here, we talking today, we ready to step up. I don't know any police officers in the building today, but uh, after this, I hope we could just build and make things work. Cause me, I would love to hang on my grandma's block and sit on my grandma's step, but I don't think that's the safe thing for me to do. If I sit on my grandma's step, I think it would be, have to be a secure firearm there for me myself, you know what I'm saying? But I would love to. So I you think, know so many ways you could go about it. Yeah, and finally, we, this would be the last question. But um, like you said, I think for any of these things to happen, there has to be um, some positive dialogue, but also some real accountability. Because the police can't do their jobs. We want them to keep, help us keep our community safe, but they can't, we can't trust them if there's you know, the reputation that they have or their... their yeah, and it's two ways. When I'm talking ways. about like me having a firearm, uh, to, I want to have a firearm to protect my life, it ain't even really for the cops. It's for my own neighborhood. So it's right. like really a two-way street to go about this. And I think just Philly, because I travel the world a lot and I see, I watch cultures of like, I watch uh, Atlanta. You go to Atlanta, they have a lot of black police. Like when you get pulled over by police, you feel like you can identify to some level. You, you feel... A, a little bit safe, you know what I'm saying? You look like someone that looked like you. If you get pulled over three o'clock in the morning and 
uh, all your life you've been hearing police has been racist and you know, you might not have never experienced that, but you know, if, if that's what's been in your mind and that's what you've been seeing all your life, you get pulled over three o'clock in the neighborhood. Me, myself, I don't even want to pull over tonight. I don't even want any contact because I don't know what you can do. I got pulled over on 12th and Gerard. This is a fact coming from 106 in Park in New, in, in New York. It was a uh, Sandy, my album dropped 2012, October 23rd. That was the week of the Sandy hurricane, so I could not fly out of New York I was on probation. I had to drive back to Philadelphia to fly private. I got pulled over on 12th and, uh, 12th and Gerard. Actually, had an a off-duty police officer in my car because you can't carry a firearm in New York. And since we here, I rap, I got to break it down because, you know, rappers give it to you all types of ways. They say you should have security. You shouldn't. It's almost like a suicide mission. So I always look at it like, should I have my friend, this is, well, in an ignorant way of thinking how uh, we deliver it sometimes. Should I have my friend drive to New York to protect me with a gun when I could hire somebody for $200 to protect me all day the legit way? Which way should I do it? So I did it the legit way, rode back to Philly. I get pulled over by a police officer. He smelled weed in the car. He does not, he don't know it's a cop in his car yet. I don't smoke weed, I'm on probation. I never had a... Uh, uh, a technical violation for weed the 10 years I've been on probation. I just got off probation. I tried my thing. I, I relax here and there now. Uh, but uh, he pulled me out the car. More of the story, I went to jail. I lost my money. I lost my money for my plane. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to do good. I got pulled back. And me, I would never sue the police. I lost $400,000. I lost probably $200,000 for the show, probably $800,000, a lawsuit, a bunch of stuff. You know what I'm saying? And I wanted my money back. He pulled me over, locked me up, let me go. I didn't get charged. I went to court. He said he seen heroin in the back of my car. These are, these are factual documents you could go pull up off the internet. He said it looked like he seen racks of heroin in my car. At this time, I'm making millions of dollars. I end up losing a lawsuit. And I got violated. I went to jail, ended up losing a bunch of money, my family, my freedom, and just from one person pulling me over. And that's, and that's just giving you the breakdown of a mind frame. Like, nine times out of 10, most of these kids don't even want to stop because they don't know your life can turn around in the matter of a pullover, you know what I'm saying? And luckily, I have resources, and I have lawyer money, and I have a back in that. I could come out of that situation, but you know, you got thousands of others that don't. And I think we, we need to address that soon. No doubt, I think people, sometimes take for granted the, the actual impact or how much power officers has, but, and how easy it is to just derail, you know, your life. And, um, you know, I think that's a great example. I think we're going to move to some questions for a few questions from the audience, if we have some. My name is Hannah Sassaman. I'm a community organizer with a group in Philly called the Media Mobilizing Project, which has been focusing on criminal justice and technology for a few years. Um, the question that I have is, we've been seeing massive abuse um, covered up both inside the department with the stories that have been coming out, as well as a lot of complaints out in our neighborhood, not even rising up to the level where internal affairs or arbitration is taking care of it. So my question for you, maybe this is for Dr. Callahan, although I'd love to hear what anyone on the panel has to say, is what should we demand that the next pol police com commissioner concretely do to fix the broken system where police are supposed to hold each other accountable? Uh, it, that's, a, uh, that's actually the thing I was thinking about as you were talking just then. Uh, part of the challenge, I think, in terms of, um, so there's, there's a challenge of accountability and then there's the PR challenge that comes from the fact that from the perspective of the FOP, it's like nothing ever happens that was wrong. Um, and it's hard, to, it's hard to have any confidence that they even care about bad actions on the part of officers, given that no matter how egregious, and again, close your eyes, put your finger on any point in the any space in the United States, certainly, certainly true here in Philadelphia, there's nothing almost that, I, I've never heard them say that was a bad shoot. They never admit that they do anything wrong, and it's hard to have any confidence. Um, so, one of the, which brings me to the challenge that the police commissioner is going to have. The police commissioner is going to have a challenge that's related to the contract and to the way that arbitration happens um, by contract 
with the FOP. Um, so I think one of the things, and I don't know, I don't know the, I don't know the intricacies of this exactly how you get it done, but one of the things that I think we've got to focus on um, is how to make sure the contract doesn't keep. There have been times, there are times when the police commissioner has tried to fire people who've gotten their job back via arbitration. Lots of times when that's when when that happens, and so part of what I think, and I think that's a public. It's in the public interest to bring pressure to bear in the various places, including in Harrisburg, to make sure that we don't end up in the next set of contract negotiations with a contract that makes it impossible to hold police accountable. We'll take a question over here. All right. Hello, I'm Michaela Brown. I'm 16 years old and I attend Boulding High School. Today I'm here with my program, NOMO. Um, so my first question is, um, we talked a lot about how the system is a big monster. You also talked about accountability. But if the system is a big monster, like, how can we really change that? And you talked about accountability and how they need to be held accountable, correct? But they are being held accountable considering the fact that we have in conferences like this, they are being held accountable due to the fact that they're also going into the court system. But being held accountable doesn't mean that they're actually taking action after that because they're being let off free and they're letting go. So what can we do to really challenge that? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I what, I would say, what I would say is like, uh, I don't mean like me, like when I come speak on panels, me, I use my experiences to like deliver messages to inform people if you don't come from this walk of life. So I don't have like, I mean, I would be up here lying if I tell you what is the solution for the cops to do to, stop violence and make the, make the relationship with our community better, I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. all I can say is we gotta fight. Like me, uh, I was caught up in a situation, we built it our organization, I'm on probation now. Uh, I still got a lot of work to do, I got a lot of flights to go, I got a lot of cities to touch, I got a lot of panels to speak at, and you know, I gotta, I gotta step up myself to keep the thing, to keep uh, our foundation pushing, and the moment I stop, the moment that, uh, I wouldn't be a part of that. I'm pretty sure Mike can only keep it going. Uh, but you know, I would say step up. All of us have to step up. Me and my position, I gotta step up. So I think we all do. I think to, to add on to that, I think the, the biggest thing for us to do is put pressure on those who have the power to actually implement these changes, right? Because you have other powers that be like the FOP that, that fight against every change you try to put in. And so we talk about accountability. The FOP is a big part of that and getting people in high levels of authority to actually go against the grain. So I think getting Larry Krasner as the DA was uh, a, big, a big jump in that direction. But in some of the things that he's trying to implement, the FOP is fighting against it. And so it's up to us to put pressure on the mayor, to put pressure on whoever this next candidate is for, or this next um, commissioner for police is, to make sure that they are at least putting or fighting back against those powers that are not in the best interest of the public. And I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I'm sorry. All right, I think we're going oh, to get to it because we got like two minutes left. Oh, right, yeah. So I'm going to get to this next question over here. You trying to go hard, huh? Our chance to be heard. Not to listen to millionaires and people of privilege who are in the Whoa, Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, so. Okay. We're going to get this question. Okay. You got it, brother. Okay, okay, all right. I'm gonna ask my question, y'all gonna be quiet. Um, so my name is Devon Washington. I am an organizer with Black Lives Matter Philadelphia and also the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund. Um, and my question is, or my comment is, um, I'm wondering why we are starting from the premise that we don't know really what to do, what our path is forward. Um, I think the ACLU was integral in helping to quantify uh, the harms that are caused by the Philadelphia Police Department, along with the DOJ. There's many a cops reports um, on what the police department needs to do to reform its practices. So I'm wondering, like, as we are advocating uh, on a public space and public forum, why is it that we aren't talking more about what the courts and what the DOJ has found that the police department needs to do in order for it to, um, to fix a lot of its uh, issues? Good question. 
And that's a great question. I think a lot of those uh, topics and issues are going to be hit on some of our later panels. We're just starting the discussion, obviously, just kind of laying the groundwork of what, obviously, some of the issues are pertaining to uh, the police in our community. Yeah. We got time for one more question. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Helen Gim, City Council Member, uh, Chair of Children and Youth, and I just wanted, um, first of all, to thank both of you, especially. That's why we're in a position that we're in, because everybody wants to kiss the asses of people who have more money than us. She gets to ask her questions every Thursday at City Council. She's a council person. We never get a voice. Come on, man. Thank you. you Thank you very much. So I wanted to, first of all, acknowledge all the young people in the audience, especially young people as young as elementary school and the high school students who are here. And my question, my question is for them, um, because I want to ask um, Meek and uh, Reverend Callahan, thank you so much. But can you talk to me about how the next police commissioner has to change the school to prison pipeline? They have to divert away from the over arrests and the charges that are happening to young people. And we've got a bill moving through the state legislature right now that gives arresting powers to the school police, um, which we cannot allow to go through. But we need the next police commissioner to talk about how to end the arrest and overcharging of young people. And I think both of you could speak to that. And Reverend Callahan, if you can just talk about moving towards a transformative environment, restorative justice, and stop punishing young people in need. Young people need to be cared for, but if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, one, one, at one time, somebody I knew asked me, like, uh, I think it was Michael Rubin asked me what was my first arrest. My first arrest was actually going to school on the day I was suspended. If you go to school on a day you're suspended without, like, telling your parents, that would be a start of, like, me and my friends, that was the start of our criminal history of trespassing, going to school on the day that you were suspended. So, you know, that was just the beginning of my criminal history. And the next was uh, the case I caught. I talked about the cops that I, I pointed a firearm at them. Uh, she said it. I mean, I, th I think that the... Um, I actually was trying to, to point to that kind of issue when I talked about kind of our reaction. Our reaction to anything is incarceration or arrest them, put them in jail. We do, and we do start with children. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I, we, don't, we do need more creative ways. And there are people who do this. Um, that, that goes back to, to another thing that I said in my introductory remarks about the about 21st century um, ways of dealing with conflict. Um, and it's, it's there are diverse ways that have to do with more, act, more physical activity, uh, meditation, other ways of dealing with conflict in communities beginning with childhood. Um, but it, it seems like our, our automatic response to anything, when anything goes wrong, our automatic response is let's find a way to to take them out of the school, let's find a way to lock them up, let's find a way to shove people out of our sight rather than doing the harder work of finding ways to attend to issues of poverty, to attend to issues, the issues that, that precede the behavior that we want to divert. So, I, I mean, you said it yourself, I agree with you, and, Councilwoman. And to uh, I, the guy previously, he spoke on the DOJ, like, even the juveniles, uh, I seen something where the juveniles was getting beat, like at Satan Games and things like that. Me coming up uh, as, a, as a kid, 17, 16 years old, most of my friends was like in juvenile detention centers. They were taking kids from neighborhoods and just shipping them to the suburbs with people, some of them, not all of them was raised, some of them people, they told me like, it was probably like a 70-30 ratio of, of bad people that staff, but you know, they're raising our kids. You're raising our kids in, in Camp Hill and things like that. It will never be a connection with us, you know what I'm saying? You have someone else taking our kids to the mountains and raising our kids at 16 years old and then putting them back into a ruthless environment. I don't know what type of problem fixing that is. I, don't, I, I never seen it, and that was my life coming up. And, uh, I think uh, me, now that I'm, I make money, I, I, I always ask Michael Rubin, I'm like, oh, how can we get a hold of a juvenile detention center? How can we get a hold of a, a, a prison to help our people? Because we got our people going into places that uh, do us no service. 
All right, so we're gonna, uh, yeah, appreciate that. We're gonna keep diving into, um, you want, oh, okay, oh no, we got one more, one more question. You ready to go. get this question there you off go. You ready to be heard. Okay, well, anyway, I apologize for people holding up, but when I'm in here with people whose lives depend on having these conversations and being able to ask their questions and we're always ignored and we're always overlooked and everything is crumbling around us, then that, that's just how I feel like I have to disrupt because we never get a voice. Why would a council person come and stand in front of the people who are affected by these issues and take a question? My question is for Reverend Callahan. Um, Reverend Callahan is on the Philadelphia Housing Authority Board of Commissioners and she has continuously ignored um, brutality, excessive force, and um, the misuse of PHA's private police force who is mocking the Philadelphia police in vehicle and uniform style and engaging in patterns of Fourth Amendment violations, though they are private security guards with the powers of police in and on the grounds and the buildings of the housing authority. And um, I've come in there month after month. Reverend Callahan has remained silent when PHA police murdered John Dawkins, the son of the owner of the first black-owned McDonald's in Philadelphia. Um, his son, and um, multiple people come in time after time, and Ms. Callahan has said a lot of stuff about police accountability, but you sit back and you ignore the abuses of the Philadelphia Housing Authority police who only target poor, mostly poor and minority populations in PHA. So I wanted to know if you're willing to bring some of your ideas about the Philadelphia police and use your position on the Philadelphia Housing Authority Board of Commissioners to get this same kind of accountability for this private police force that's completely unaccountable to anybody. So um, I, am a, I am a commissioner on the Housing Authority. I am not authorized, however, to speak for the Housing Authority. What I will say is that the policing and the Housing Authority gets adjudicated. The, the case that she brought up got adjudicated in court. Um, and it got adjudicated in court and there were, there were lawyers for the various parties and there was a process of adjudication um, that I don't have anything to do with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get out of here too, look, uh, I always, me, you know, I, I pay a lot of attention to media and things like that. I always try to use my platform to like put certain stories out there. What I can say is just me uh, personally from experience coming from actually poverty and making it to where I'm at now, just halfway along the way, I say value yourself. Uh, I always say this, I posted this the other day. We had four little kids get shot here last week. It ain't making national news. They don't care. If they don't care, we have to care first. We got to take care of ourselves first. That's how I look at it. Uh, I hold four babies getting shot to the same level of a guy running a school shooting up kids. It's the same level. People are losing lives. Philadelphia. Uh, uh, in Philadelphia, you probably got seven people who die a week. It's still seven lives lost in a week. It's still mass murdering going on. It's not being viewed in value, like our lives are not being valued to that level. So, you know, I think we, we got to take a step our own self and, you know, go a little overboard and, and value ourselves. Me now, uh, me, I never, a cop pulled me over five years ago, hands on a steering wheel, all lights on. Uh, I was scared to death. Now I pull over, officer, I ain't do nothing. What did I do? Can you tell me what I did? You know, I value myself and they can feel and see when they talk to me, I value myself and... Uh, like I have a, a foundation. I, I don't know how to explain it, but you know, for our people, value ourselves, protect one of each other. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, uh, in our neighborhood, like self-hate is like a big deal. When we talking about three, four hundred murders a year, black on black crime, that's like a, that's a real big deal. You know what I'm saying? That we from this area and we don't want to come outside without no guns. It's like something we're going to have to do on our end and then after we do that, we're going to address them in the strongest way. They will have to value us to the level that we need to be valued on if we approach it that way. I, I just truly believe that that's my way. That might not be everybody else's system. That's just how I feel deep in my deep side of my heart because I value myself. I remember I thought being beat up by a cop was normal. A cop lying on you was normal because that was my everyday reality. I explained that to my friend. He's a billionaire. He come from a suburban world. He don't understand. You can say something to him, but... You wouldn't understand the effects unless you see it or, or lived it. And I used to always say, like, yo, you think I point a gun at a cop? You think I would be chilling here with you, this uh, team owner, if I pointed a gun at a cop? You think I would be sitting here on this table if 
This whole room thought, I, on this panel, if they thought I pointed a gun at a police officer. No, that wouldn't be the case. So, you know, value, I think, is a, a, a big part of it. And, you know, uh, we got to learn more. We got to uh, make people aware of our lifestyle, where we come from. Me, nine times out of ten, when I get on these panels, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm here to make people aware of the ruthless lifestyle that we come from, an unfair lifestyle, because I am a celebrity, and they may miss listen to me more than a person they don't never heard of. So, you know, that's my piece right there. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Shout out to Malcolm. Shout yeah. out to Pastor. We encourage you to keep walking in that truth. Uh, please give it up for Reverend Callahan and Meek Mill. I think the community trust with the police is broken because far too often in the community that I'm from, uh, we see police that do not resemble of ethnic demographics like we look or are not from our communities. So we get a... Uh, a anger approach when we get approached by someone who doesn't look like us, who's not from where we're from, telling us what they think is the law. So I think that the next police commissioner for this city should be someone that is willing to see the community as a partner and someone that is willing to take some dialogue with the community and neighborhoods that, um, that the police community serves and have felt victimized in the past. Um, and I think really having that conversation um, with all elements of the community about the things that are important to them is something that's going to be really important for the city to be able to move forward with its, its police and community relations. This next panel, if you would get ready to welcome to the stage Reverend Dr. Alan E. Waller with Enon Baptist Church. <laughs> Ms. Patricia Cummings, head of Conviction Integrity uh, Unit for the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. And also Mr. G. Lamar Stewart, Director of Community Engagement from the DA's Office. Also a former police officer and also a licensed minister. And just to let you know, as part of the conversation, uh, once Meek and Malcolm are back after uh, this panel, we also have representatives who are here from the mayor's office who will talk to us directly about where they are in the process of selecting the next police commissioner. And so from that representation, we have Brian Apernathy, who's the managing director from the mayor's office, and also Tumar Alexander. So that is also coming up on the program. All right, so let's get started with our first question. We're gonna talk a little bit about accountability. Um, of course, that's the big question of how much is there, where are we lacking in that, and what can be done to improve accountability. So my first question to the panelists is this. Uh, looking at the previous commissioners and maybe where they did not connect and maybe where they failed at some things, uh, what would you say needs to change in the future and what can be done to restore trust? Mr. Stewart. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I think that uh, what's important for the next commissioner that's coming in and when we look back at the last uh, few commissioners is the need to uh, prioritize community collaboration uh, and uh, allowing voices from the community uh, to be at the table on the front end uh, and not just after a situation takes place, whether it's a police involved shooting or, or some police misconduct. So I think we look at going forward um, uh, as I assess uh, prior administrations, um, there's definitely a need to uh, uh, have community voices at the table, community-based organizations, grassroots organizations, uh, community organizers, faith-based community. Um, as it relates to both uh, challenging the policy, but also looking at training and, and background investigation uh, and who's coming into the department. Uh, I definitely think that the next commissioner would uh, benefit if they had community voices at the table. Ms. Cummings. So I have to um, preface the answer to my question with just making sure if you don't know that you know that I'm a transplant here in Philadelphia. I've been here just shy of two years. Um, so I can't give you the personal perspective of knowing what all the previous commissioners did, but I can tell you from having been here for almost two years that I've looked very closely at two different things. The first is claims where people have been in prison for decades for crimes they say they didn't commit. 
The second is trying to look at police accountability when police officers engage in misconduct. And I can tell you from looking at both of those that there clearly is a problem and the culture, as we've heard so much about tonight, needs to be changed. The culture is terrible. Um, the system is racist here in Philadelphia. There is no doubt and lots of terrible Lots of terrible, terrible things have happened, and I think there is no doubt that police commissioners who have been in charge, they're the leaders, and they have allowed it to happen on their watch. Um, and things have got to change. And so to kind of sum it up into your, the, the latter part of your question, which was how do you restore trust, I gotta tell you, I'm not so sure that's the right question because the feeling that I'm getting is there never has been trust, um, that we've gotta figure out how to establish and create trust. And from what I'm seeing, just from this little less than two years, we got a whole lot of work to do. Great point, yeah. Um, Pastor Waller. Yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, question. The, the reality is this didn't get this way overnight. Uh, there has been systemic error for a long time. And when you look at policing in Philadelphia, you also have to consider that the office of the mayor in Philadelphia is a much stronger office than in many cities. And so when you look at some of the patterns, uh, you have to trace back a lot of what you see back to a Rizzo administration. Uh, you have to look at what has happened since that time. You have to also consider that we tend to try to compartmentalize uh, solutions. So we turn to the police so that the police will fix the police. But until we engage across the system and engage the systemic racism, engage the broken system across the board, uh, which uh, no one has been effective ultimately in doing that. Uh, there have been pieces uh, that have been handled, but uh, there's not been an effective approach at uh, dealing with the systemic brokenness that uh, is across all of the departments within government. And because of that, we've not been able to get at the root. The, the answer, how do we get at uh, trust? Truth and transparency. Truth, speaking truth, but also having transparency so that we can check the math of those that are speaking. And so uh, there, I am grateful today. Uh, I'm not the leader, but the Coalition uh, for Justice, Brother Solomon Jones from WRD is sitting out here and he has helped us uh, press the issue around transparency. We're gonna need everyone to bring their homework to the public while we're addressing systemic change, which has not been done yet. Brother Solomon is here and other influencers and activists in the community. We're glad to see your faces here. You say truth and transparency, Pastor Waller, and then let's get back to training. As a former officer yourself, Mr. Stewart, can there truly be a system or a guideline of training that can help officers reduce biases, reduce discrimination? Can that, it, I mean, on the surface, you would have to think there has to be at least training to address it. So can you talk more about training for officers? There certainly can be training to address it, but there can be training to change a person from being a racist. And so I think, you know, we, we really have to, we have to really look at this before a, a person gets to the training bureau at the police academy, they go through a background investigation process. Uh, and un unfortunately, th there's not enough uh, checks and balances uh, within that process um, where, where, we, where we can confidently say that the persons that we're allowing into the academy uh, will police our communities effectively. Uh, and so I, I go back to the point I was making earlier when it, uh, as it relates to having the community at the table, even in the background investigation process or in the recruitment process or in the hiring process, it's possible to, for the next commissioner to establish a application review board made up of civilians so that the community can see every particular person who's coming into the ranks to make sure that these are persons that we want to police our community. Um, and so uh, can you train a person not to be a racist? Absolutely not. 
but can you have training that will challenge that racism? Absolutely. Ms. Cummings, what's your view in regards to the training as what, you know, you in the DA's office in this unit that you're in, you're looking to right wrongs, people who have been convicted wrongly. So if we could do something on the front end, wouldn't that help your office, I guess, too? Sure, and let me say that I think that the problem in the district attorney's office has been as bad as the police department here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I've, I've often asked the question, you know, which dog was wagging the tail? Um, was the police controlling the prosecutor's office for a long time or was it vice versa? I don't know the answer to that. All I know is that there's problems. Every single day I walk into the office and I am asked to look at cases where people are claiming that there has been mistreatment, that there are allegations that witnesses were coerced into incriminating people that did nothing wrong. I see it every day. And so when I think about the question of will training fix it, I have to tell you, um, no pun intended, you know, the trains left the station on that to a great extent. Um, Meaning there's already so many who wear the badge. Training is not going to fix it. Training is important, and I'm never going to say you should not have it, but what we've really got to do is we've got to figure out how to fix the culture. Um, let me give you an example. You think of the brass at the police department, and recently we've been trying to say, hey, give us information when police officers engage in misconduct, not only because defendants are entitled to that information, information, but as prosecutors, we ought to know before we prosecute somebody as to whether or not we should trust the cop who's bringing us the case. However, despite kind of this simple notion that our country has had for a long time, we've had so much pushback from the police department in terms of getting that information. That's crazy. Mm. That is absolutely crazy. And I will tell you, the brass where I started has put us in a position where we, where we get some information, but not all of it, and it just so happens that they're not giving us the misconduct for the brass. What, what are you teaching um, the police department if you're saying to your officers, hey, look, I'm going to tell the DA's office when you engage in misconduct, but I'm not going to tell them when the brass has done something wrong? So there's something just fundamentally wrong, and it's, it's a culture, and the culture's got to be changed. And once you start doing that, training is a part of it. Um, but at this point, it cannot be looked at as an exclusive sole remedy to the problems we're facing. It's multi-layered, clearly. Multi -layered, We've got a lot to sure. do. Pastor Waller, is there some level of behavior that just should not be tolerated when this next police commissioner is installed? Should there just be some things when an officer does or commits, they're suspended or they're fired? You know, what about behavior for the next commissioner to evaluate? Thank you for that. Um, in, in South Africa, they, there's a word, sawabana, uh, that it's, it's a greeting. And it says, and it really means, I see you. And in a lot of African language, the greeting of hello means I see you. Fundamentally, as human beings, when we see another human being, we have to see that human being. When any of us who are professionals no longer see human beings as human beings, we no longer are allowed to hold our profession. And so whatever profession that is, the key to being a good anything is seeing the human being. And when you no longer see a human being, that's when racist remarks come out of your mouth. When you no longer see a human being, that's when your baton comes out or your gun comes out. When you no longer see a human being, that's when your Facebook posts reveal what's really on the inside. Anytime you show us that you've lost sight of human beings. You no longer deserve the high honor of having that badge. Uh, we have to get back to acknowledging human beings. I can disagree with a human being. I can be on the opposite side of the political fence with a human being. And nothing bad has to happen, but when I no longer see the human being, I no longer should be allowed to have that sacred office. Uh, and so I think that when we begin to see that behavior, 
that without question is when it's time to give up because we hold those of us who hold any profession, whether it is me as a preacher or a, a brother as an imam or a person as a police officer, uh, there's certain levels of deferment that come with that. And we ought to accept that we are held to a higher standard. And that higher standard is not sinless perfection, but that higher standard is seeing all people as human beings. And when you fail to do that, you no longer can serve us in this high office. I see you. Um, what was the word, Pastor, from? Sawabana. Sawabana. Uh, in regards then to checking the police, if we look internally and externally, um, for example, under the Plainview Project, of course, we know 13 officers were fired because of the uncoverings of the work that was found in regards to uh, racist and insensitive marks, remarks made online. But it dated back for quite a while, which means the behavior uh, had gone on quite a while unchecked. Um, we also know, in addition to the racial and social concerns, there is now a lot of substantial allegations about sexual harassment happening at the top of the department, some of the highest ranking officers. And this dates back for years, some over a decade, and they are just now coming to light. And uh, Assistant DA Cummings, you mentioned it about they are even protecting the brass internally. So how then do we go about getting accountability internal? Can we really continue to rely on internal affairs? Who's going to police the police? So you, you mentioned um, at the beginning of your question, it's an internal and an external situation, but you, I think, are wanting me to focus on internally. And I got to tell you, there's no doubt in my mind that internal affairs is not working like it should. Um, does that mean I think you get rid of them and that you cannot have them? And I, I'm going to tell you the answer is no. Um, if I said you get rid of them, that would be kind of like saying, don't have somebody do my job that I'm doing in the district attorney's office right now. And I do believe that what we need to try to do to effectuate culture change is we've got to have people internally trying to do the right thing. And what that means for internal affairs is it means a new police commissioner needs to send the message loud and clear that they, that person is dedicated to a real functioning internal affairs where people are qualified to do the job and they're given the resources they need to do it. Bottom line, it's not going to be easy, but those are very simple, fundamental concepts that I think, unfortunately, have not been respected over decades. Isn't that what internal affairs is supposed to be? Absolutely. But it's difficult. It's difficult to have somebody within an office actually function in a way to make sure that they're stopping the bad conduct. There's, there's no doubt that it's difficult, but just because it's difficult doesn't mean it can't be successful. Which is why I take it then, Mr. Stewart, it's so important for whoever is the next police commissioner to make it very clear certain behavior just will not be tolerated, and we are watching you internally. Absolutely. Uh, you know, as my colleague mentioned, uh, I think it's very important for them to make the message clear, but also for whoever is the next police commissioner, they won't, they, they can't be afraid to, uh, they have to have enough courage to uh, stand up against um, the culture itself, um, the, the blue culture, if you would, um, but also be able to stand up against um, the police union uh, when that's necessary. Um, they, they can't be afraid to, to, stand on integrity um, and, and stand for what's right. I don't know what can be done in regards to the union. I don't know if you guys are aware, but there are dozens of officers who were recommended by previous commissioners to be fired and to be suspended, and yet because they are union members, the union fights for them, and a large percentage of them get their jobs back. What can be done I'm going to ask this to Ms. Cummings because you're in the DA's office. Is there anything that can be done in regards to pushing back against the fraternal order of police? What I see is the union is probably, the police union, the FOP, is probably one of the most powerful entities in this city. And 
for me, coming from Texas, it's been kind of a surprise to see it. I, I don't know that I can even begin to understand how that has happened, but I do accept the fact that it has happened. And I think the beginning point is anybody who's in a position where they can fight back, push back, they must do so. They cannot be intimidated by the sheer power of the union. I think the first time you fight back, you might lose. The second time, you might still lose, but you're going to get stronger every time you push back a little bit. And eventually, I think what you do is you weaken that power because you keep fighting and you keep pushing. And when you do that, you're letting the community know that maybe all the things the FOP says that they're doing to support the community really isn't supporting the community. Um, so I think it takes that kind of attitude and approach. And as Lamar said, courage. It takes a lot of courage. It seems as if DA Krasner's office has made it clear that you are going to do the job as which you guys see fit, because I know the FOP has made it very clear they are not fans of the current uh, DA and the DA's assistants. Pastor Waller, um, the Police Advisory Commission has some power um, to make recommendations in regards to behavior that has been founded on officers, but they don't have any say-so power, so to speak. They can make recommendations. Do you think the next police commissioner ought to, to look at um, making that change to advocate for the police advisory commission to be given and granted more power. Absolutely. Uh, that is one of the issues that best practices in other cities. There are other cities that have police um, review boards that have real teeth. Uh, and that's what I meant by transparency. So we could go a long way in that particular area to have persons who give oversight and review to these practices, and who have a budget um, right. in any organization, <laughs> in any organization, check the budget. Where you put your money is where your emphasis really is. And if we put some money in the budget of the city behind this review board and give them some power, we can begin to address these issues. And that's what I meant earlier about addressing p policing by not just addressing it in the police force. Uh, it has to become a full city government concern uh, and city council needs to make sure that there is some real funds behind this new initiative so that uh, it will be reflected in our budget. Were you about to add to that, Mr. Stewart? Uh, no, I was, I was going to mention that uh, whoever is hired here in the next couple of months will be coming in uh, before the next police contract uh, is voted upon. And so uh, I think this person can really get behind some grassroots organizations uh, that's doing the work to challenge some of the terms within that contract. Um, I think that um, that the next police commissioner could can stand with uh, not just the uh, community, but also the police advisory commission in challenging the mayor, because really that's where that, that power lies um, and that decision lies as to um, as relates to the, the power and the resources that the police advisory commission has. Um, Assistant DA Cummings, the DA's office right now is playing a major role in, in trying to hold police officers accountable in the regards of office. You guys have a database where you're putting in officers' names who have proven not to be credible or who have been uh, possibly getting in allegations of maybe excessive force and other things that are negative. Um, and you have that list and you're trying to right some of the wrongs. So. For the next commissioner, uh, what do you think they should do to support those efforts uh, in regards to working, if that's possible, with the DA's office for those convictions that are out there right now that your office is actually working to take a second look and maybe even overturn convictions? So there's, there's a whole lot in that question, and, and what that question really does is it exposes something that Larry Krasner, I think, realized pretty early on, and that is when we're asked to look back at old convictions where somebody claims they're innocent, um, and meanwhile, we're trying to figure out whether or not police officers are engaging in misconduct, oftentimes there's overlap 
in that area. Um, in fact, he recognized that to the extent that what he did is he merged the Conviction Integrity Unit in the office with the Special Investigations Unit, which is the unit responsible for investigating and prosecuting cops that engage in criminal activity. So he said, let's put them together, because maybe as we're looking at what they're doing here, it might give us answers as to whether or not they did it wrong back then and vice versa. And we are finding that that is in fact the case. Um, so it, it's really important to be willing to go down that road. Um, and it, it is a difficult road to go down because when you're looking backwards 30 or 40 years, it's often hard to find the information you need to right the wrong. And then of course, when you're looking forward, you have everybody nipping at your heels trying to stop you from gathering the information. Um, so you gather the information, you use it, and you use it for multiple purposes. You use it to hold the police accountable. You use it to try to make sure you right the wrongs of the past. And so that combination, I think, is essential. And hopefully, it's going to help force some culture changes in Philadelphia. As Meek was saying earlier, you know, it's not that the point is every officer is a bad officer. There's no all to anything. There's bad people in every profession, right? So, but when you discuss looking at allegations of wrongdoing by officers, is this rampant? What percent of officers or cases, how can we give an example to people of how deep the problem runs? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking carefully about whether or not I would use the ra word rampant. Um, and it's hard for me to have a point of comparison. You know, I come from Texas, I come into Philadelphia, and it is, you know, it's bad. I guess I have to just say, yeah, it's rampant. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not looking at something that shocks me in regard to various behaviors that a police officer engaged in. And what's even worse is not just seeing that it happened, but seeing more often than not that that police officer is still on the force and still dealing with people in the community and still bringing cases to our office saying, here, go ahead and prosecute them. And then we are forced to say, and what makes you think we can trust you and the information you're bringing us? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it is rampant. And I gotta tell you, it's, it's oftentimes like the saying about, you know, our society doesn't wanna convict an innocent person. You guys have probably heard the saying, this has been a principle for hundreds of years, better to let guilty people go free than convict an innocent person. And I gotta say on some level, when you have police officers that are engaging in criminal activity and coercing confessions out of people by beating them, one, one is enough. One is probably too much. Um, so defining rampant is a bit relative. We are optimistic that change can come, are we, Pastor Waller, as we look to see whoever uh, will be selected to be the next police commissioner, that some of this behavior can be stunted? Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't be out here if I were only out here talking about what's wrong. And the harder piece, the harder part of this discussion for all of us is anyone that gets a mic tonight, you would be right from your perspective. Because the truth of the matter is, there's some police officer that needs to be off the force right now because he or she doesn't deserve it. The truth of the matter is, there's somebody on a corner tonight that needs to be picked up and go to jail. The truth of the matter is, there are some good people in bad places and there are some bad people in good places. They come in all shapes and colors. And we have to continue to fight for the, the majority of us everywhere, I believe, are good people. And we cannot allow the outliers and those that do not have a good heart or a heart towards community to run the story. I believe in good police officers. Integrity says that I need to tell you um, that if I, weren't a, if I weren't a preacher, I think I'd want to be a police officer. I have been a chaplain for the police. 
I've been a chaplain with the Army. I honor people who wear the uniform, and that's why I have a great disdain for people who dishonor the uniform because there are more good people in Philadelphia and on the planet than the foolishness that we give too much time to talk about. And so I'm going to keep fighting because I believe the right side of this, we're going to win. Um, I'm going to make this our final question here because I think we'll need the time for it, which is we do ask police officers to do a lot. We ask police officers to respond to mental health concerns. We ask police officers to respond to incidents at schools and to solve what's happening at school and society's problems. Um, but there's a lot, of course, that maybe that they cannot do. And in for, so for this next police commissioner, is it important for he or she to say, here's what we are going to do and here's where we won't go. Here's what we will not be um, trying to solve or fix. Is that just as brave to be that honest on what they shouldn't be getting involved in? What would we say about that portion? Uh, Mr. Stewart, we'll start with you. You know, we, as, as, a, as a first responder, when people call 911, police are going to show up. This is where I think training comes in because to a certain degree, I believe police officers need to be trained properly and, and there are some that, who are doing great, a great job at it, uh, but they have to be able to, to respond to whether it's a mental health crisis or something going on at school, or whatever the case may be. Um, they, they have to be trained to be able to do that. That's just because they are first responders. I, I don't think that the commissioner who comes in should say, this here is just not our job. I think that uh, that we all have to be flexible uh, and the next police commissioner come in need to see. Uh, one of the things I said when I was still with Philadelphia Police Department is that we identify as a paramilitary organization rather than a service-based organization. And when you're a service-based organization, you're thinking about providing a service to, to whoever you're responding to in that moment. And you may not be able to uh, fulfill everything uh, with that service, but you can call on another service provider to do that. So if it's a mental health concern, you can get the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities involved. If it's something with, uh, with a, uh, someone who needs support around sexual abuse, you can get uh, women organized against a rape uh, involved with that. If it's, whatever that dynamic may be, um, I think that we, we can't say this is just not our job. Um, if you're responding, you have to deal with what you're responding to. I think a part of the shift in culture has to be that police have to see that good police work is not just chasing bad guys. That good police work is, is providing a service whatever the circumstance may require in that moment. And so uh, I, I think that's a part of the shift in culture. Ms. Cummings. I think Lamar's right. I don't think that you want to start by saying what you can't do, unless, of course, what you want to say is what we can't do is encourage people to take this job so they could make $150,000 to $200,000 a year in overtime. You know, maybe you could start by saying something like that. But the bottom line is police officers in our communities are to serve and protect. And, and Lamar is right. I mean, you say that that's what we're going to do and to the extent that our folks are not qualified to do something, you figure out how to be a resource to steer people in the right direction. Pastor Waller. Well, I, I echo uh, what has been said. And again, I think the next commissioner needs to come in with an understanding that number one, they're coming to a good city. This is Philadelphia. It's a great city and it's full of great people because if you begin thinking that you are a warden coming to take care of the inmates, you're already having the wrong perspective. You have to come in knowing that you've come to one of the greatest cities in the union and that you're coming to serve the people that live in this city. And if you begin with that perspective, I think we can get a whole lot done. If I, if I can just add this, while, while we're having this conversation, whoever comes in, you know, we, we have to prioritize victims. I mean, there, there are people out here dying on the streets each day. There are young people who are uh, being victims of gun violence. There are young women who are, who are being shot. Uh, there's a lot, there are babies who are being shot. I, I think we have to, the next police commissioner has to come in uh, understanding that there are a lot of cultural changes that need to be made. But whether it's the police department, whether it's the DA's office, whether it's service-based organizations, we have to work together to make sure that persons who are impacted the most, who are vulnerable, uh, are, are being served with professionalism and with integrity. Okay. Mr. G. Lamar Stewart. 
Ms. Patricia Cummins, and of course, Pastor Alan Waller. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Um, the next panel is about to take the stage, and after the next panel, we'll have another round of questions just to conserve time. We're not going to take questions at this portion. We'll um, go to the next panel, and after that panel, all of the um, panelists and moderators will be on the stage to take questions once again at the end. I'm Shari Williams, guys. Thanks for having us on the panel. I think our next police commissioner should be someone that's very honest and who understands the minority community, someone who isn't afraid of us and knows how to treat us like we should be treated, like the people that we are. What do I want to tell the mayor about the next police commissioner? I think that when it comes to the mayor and policing and the police commissioner that when it comes to combating street violence, we need to include more people with lived experience, more people from the criminal justice system who have an education and a connection to the streets. We need to involve them with, with reducing street violence. These are people with lived experience. These are credible messengers. Yes, I do think the trust with the police in our community is broken. Um, I had a few of my peers who got killed, and I thought, like, the police will find out who did it. Um, we don't have, like, police riding around in our neighborhood to keep us safe when things happen. Like, people get robbed, shot on the corner, broad daylight. One of my friends, he was, like, walking home from school, and he got killed in broad daylight. And I just was like, where's the police? Like, where are they at? Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last panel of the night, which is limiting unnecessary police contacts and ending the criminalization of poverty. Uh, we'll be joined by Malcolm Jenkins, who you all met and know. <laughs> Keir Bradford Gray, who is the chief public defender here in Philly. <laughs> and Mary Catherine Roper, who is the assistant legal director of the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Deputy Legal Director, I'm sorry. So, welcome, thanks for coming out. And back out, Malcolm. So, I wanna start with you, Malcolm, just talk, thinking about this topic. You know, you're out in the community, you're interacting with people in the community all the time. You also interact quite a bit with people who are making, decision, making decisions about what happens in the community and police. So I wanna ask you specifically about the title of this panel and what are the biggest things that you've seen while you're out there regarding unnecessary police contacts with people in the community? Yeah, I think when we look at how we want uh, the police department to function for us, you know, in society, we want them to keep us safe. We want them to be doing the right thing. So we look at, you know, uh, homicide and, and, and gun violence. Those are the things that we want our police departments to be helping our communities doing. And quite frankly, they're failing in that regard, only making arrests in about 44% of those uh, cases. And so when we look at the, the overall budget that we're given to our police department, it's like 14% of the city's budget at $741 million compared to the $100 million that we give to health services. And so when you start to look at what these effects have on communities, not only does it mess up the trust, but the data that they're doing is not working and it's not serving the purpose that we want. Um, when you look at, you know, the fact that, like I said, they're not solving these hard things, but when it comes to traffic stops, they're on an all-time high. They're, you know, stopping and, and pulling over people, 10,000 more people per month than they did last year. And in, in those people, they're majority of black and brown people. And, the, and it's not like they're finding things either. Only 12% of the people that they stop that are black and brown actually have any kind of illegal substance on them or anything like that. So the, the effort that we're putting out, the money that we're allocating to it, or just from a data standpoint, are not adding up and it's not working. It's causing uh, more and more contact, which causes more and more people of a specific you know, uh, area or people of color to be trapped into or introduced to a system that we know all too well the effects of. And I, I want to take it to you, Mary Catherine, because because you, with your, in your work with the ACLU, you brought lawsuits dealing specifically with this issue, right? The extent to which police are effectively harassing people on the street for low-level offenses or stopping them unnecessarily. So can you talk a little bit about, your, about those lawsuits and then how police in the city have responded to the lawsuits, if they have at all? Uh, so you know, this didn't come about just magically, right? I, when he was running for mayor, Michael Nutter said, I'm going to increase the use of stop and frisk 
uh, because I think it's going to stop gun violence. Um, well, it, he certainly increased the use of stop and frisk. It didn't really stop gun violence. Um, what it did was massively increase the number of times that people are stopped by police for little or no reason, harassed, um, patted down, maybe then arrested for something that the police didn't even you know, know when they looked at them. That's, but the, the bigger part of it is it's simply a waste of time. If your police are stopping people because they've got an open liquor container or because they spit on the street or because they're loitering, those are police officers who are not out solving violent crime, who are not making communities safer. And the question is, what is it that you think you're paying your police officers for? Now, I will say, after years of litigation, former police commissioner Ross brought the stop and frisk numbers down really far. But, and that's right, I mean, that is something to be grateful for. But one thing that did not change was the racial disparities in the stop. Another thing that did not change was the percentage of stops that are for, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to swear here, uh, stupid little stuff, let's put it that way. Um, and it, you know, once again, and by the way, if you ask the police, why do you do this? Why do you stop people for carrying an open container? Why do you arrest people? Why are you harassing kids who are out after curfew? They'll tell you, well, that's what we hear from the community. And I think it's time for the police to hear from all of us, from the community, that that's not what we want from our police. Right. That isn't the policing we want. We don't want you stopping, coming by because there's some young men standing on the corner being loud. We want you coming by when, there's a, when someone calls because there's a crime, because there's a gunshot, because there's something that scares us. That's the policing we want. We need to all say that. And so, Keir, as the chief public defender, your office then has to deal with the fallout from this, right? Everybody who stopped for some you know, ticky-tack nonsense on the street, you know, either they then search them and find something else or say they find something else or, you know, claim that, you know, claim whatever they claim the person did to try to, to get them into the system, but now they're swept in. And so it seems like in our society, all we ever want to do is invest in policing and invest in um, prosecuting. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what that, what the, what the burden of all of this has put on your office and how you guys are working to try to actually get on the front end of things to try to prevent so many of these people from getting ensnared in the system. Yeah, well I think the burden of that is put on our city because quite frankly we are really practicing in the unproductive land instead of the productive land. If we really want to improve public safety, we will figure out what those metrics are and stop doing some of the things that we're doing now. We have brought people into our system because they have a myriad of social issues. And when we bring them in, it's costly. Not only to the taxpayers, but it's costly to the person who's gonna get a lifetime brand of a criminal conviction and now be relegated to a life of second class citizenship. Not just for them, but for their families. And so this is a civil rights moment where people need to stand up and say, why are we branding people, making them more desperate? Because we're not creative enough to create structures that deal with social conditions. One of the things that we're doing in our office is we are focused heavily on the front end. What is it that, that about certain people that we can't make differentiations about until they are already trapped in this system, have lost their job, lost their house, lost their kids, and then we tell them go out and do better. That makes no sense. And so we're trying to make better sense out of who should be in our system and who shouldn't. And we have this thing called pre-entry. And pre-entry, Malcolm and the Players Coalition have been really great supporters of that. But pre-entry means before they enter, let's figure out who they are. And one of the great things about this community is that we've used community to help us do that. And there are some amazing programs that are being paid for, that are being invested in, that never are touted, that have stepped up to the call. And so what they have done is said, I have programs that I'm gonna connect someone with on the front end. And if that works, then the progressive DA should say, we don't need this person in the criminal justice system. We can utilize these, these supports, community supports, and be a real village again. Yeah. 
And so I'll, I'll throw this out to all of you. One of the things I'm hearing is, is a common thread, and one of the things I think about when I think about these issues is that part of the problem seems to be that we as a society just want to use police to respond to everything instead of actually investing on the front end to try to make people's lives better who are struggling. And so instead of investing in services for the mentally ill or for the homeless, we just call the police to come sweep them off the street. And so what do you guys, well, I guess, do you agree or disagree with that? And if so, what can we do to sort of move away from thinking about just the only possible tool that we have as a society is the police? I, well, I'd like to make a suggestion. Uh, a lot of this obviously comes at the, the police level. They think that the community wants them to arrest our problems away. We cannot arrest our problems away. But it comes higher up the food chain than that as well. We published a report last week called More Law, Less Justice. And what it talks about is the incredible increase in the number of crimes that have been created by our legislators in Harrisburg. There were 600 and some crimes in 2010 in our crimes code. There are over 1,500 today, more than double. Uh, it, we, our, our legislators are, are, are passing new crimes at the rate of 22 a year. And most of that is, of course, duplicative nonsense, right? You, get, you walk out of a store with something that doesn't belong to you. There, you could be charged with five different things besides you know, the shoplifting, theft by deception, on and on and on. You don't need all those crimes. And just like we need to say to our police, this is not the policing we want you to do. We need to say to our elected representatives, that is not the lawmaking we want you to do. How about instead funding our schools? How about instead funding our public defense? How about instead funding uh, recovery and rescue for people who are addicted to drugs? And that was a great point. I think, you know, it's interesting. It's, everybody understands the, or it's been well documented, the human costs that come with incarceration and comes with people getting trapped into the system. The amount of leaders, fathers, people losing jobs and all the things that they already, you know, already struggling people have due to just incarceration. It's too easy to get people trapped up into it. But one of the things that um, we don't talk enough about is just even starting as early as our schools, you have more police officers in these schools than you have guidance counselors. And you got kids that are dealing with, that are coming out of traumatic situations that, are, that have real life issues um, that are completely outside of their control. And the way that we choose to deal with it is through the police or through incarceration. Um, and then the, the, the accumulating effect of all of that goes down through generations. And so when we start looking at other things around the city, like why is Philadelphia so poor? How do we climb out of poverty? The criminal justice system and the way that we police has a huge uh, effect on that because we're tying up people that, that then are just, you know, you, you're hamstringing them. They can't climb up because they have this record for some minor stuff as, as early as a youth in school, um, knowing that they're coming out of a traumatic situation. So, you know, that's, we have to continue to pound on the table to make sure that all of these, these resources that we are allocating are going toward the thing, that they, they're working the way that we want them to work. Because there's no way that our kids that are already struggling and need help should, should have more officers in their schools than they do somebody to talk to about their problems. Um, I don't know if there's a lot more to add, but I would say this. We're talking about policing, but we need to look at how the justice system emboldens that behavior. And when we talk about justice system, it's not something as simple as, oh, okay, take probation for this little you know, misdemeanor offense. We're talking about high stakes decisions that stay, on, stay with people for life. I mean, most people don't even want bad credit, let alone a criminal record. And so we're handing out criminal records like it's nothing and not understanding what we're doing to a whole community of people that can't afford that. They're already fighting with the leg down. So now we cut both of their legs off at their knees. I just think that it's something that the system should be held more morally accountable for. Um, I'm glad that we have um, DAs that are willing to be more transparent, but 
be transparent about everything. Let's understand how it is that people come in here, how decisions are being made for, for black and brown people versus white people, because that is a big deal. Even with the most transformative district attorney, transformative criminal justice systems leaders, we cannot crack the fact that African Americans are treated 10 times more harshly for just on general purposes. I was gonna say GP, but you know what that means. Uh, I just, I really do think that if we're gonna be honest about ourselves, who are we relegating to a life of second class citizenship? Who do we not care about? It is black and brown people for the most part. And that is the civil rights moment that we need to really be thinking about and figuring out how to crack through that. And so that's one of the, that's one of the things I think about when, you know, the people who are on the receiving end of this police attention who can't, you know, as, as we heard from our early panelists, who can't sit on their stoops without, ha you know, coming and being bothered by police or walk down the street without getting shaken down, are the people in, the, in, the, in society who society is most used to ignoring, right? And so who have sort of the least voice. So what do we do to make the people who are making decisions for us in our society start paying attention to the people who they're used to ignoring and, and the things that they're being put through because of decisions made at the high level of police. I d really quickly, I want to, I have my police accountability unit here, Michael Mellon and Paula Sen, who gave me some talking points. I want to just make sure that the crowd knows, because this is for us to really formulate our own alliance and, and really fight back. Um, if someone, if the police are doing things in your neighborhood, does anyone know what to do about it? Who do you call? Who do you make a complaint with? Right? Here's some of the problems that we need to fix if we really want to crack this. Here's the process if you make a complaint about a police officer. If the officer says it didn't happen and there were no other independent witnesses, the police department will generally not sustain the complaint. So the fact is, is that people, we're asking people to complain and rise up, but there's a, they're going nowhere. The data shows that only 15% of the 8,553 civilian complaints were sustained between years 2012 and 2018. So majority never go anywhere. They are never, outcomes are never announced. If the officer loses at trial, they can appeal it at least two more times so that they can really get another decision. And then for the most part, they are reinstated. This demoralizes communities and people that are being subjected to this type of behavior. And if we really want to crack some of what the officers are doing, we really need to make sure that the FOP does not, is not allowed to bargain this stuff in the collective bargaining agreement. And we need leadership in our city to step up, figure out who they need to deal with to understand the intricacies of them not doing anything on that collective bargaining action. So I think there's more of us than there's more of them. And so if we get together and we demand more from our leadership, one, speak on it, acknowledge it, take it seriously, and then learn about how we can really deal with it in, our, in, a, in a contract, I think that will be a start to something different. Another thing that we need to do besides listening to community complaints and actually taking them seriously is figure out what, we, what incentives we're giving police officers. Are we saying, hey, the more paperwork you fill out, the more stops that you do, the more credit you're going to get for being productive? How productive was that, that you did 15 car stops today? Did you solve any murders? Did you solve any robberies? We need to change the incentives for how our police do their jobs. And that is something that's gonna take leadership, new leadership, this should be a priority in our police department. So a lot of this conversation centers around the incoming commissioner, um, you know, but I think a lot of, a lot of what the commissioner is gonna be coming into, even if it's exactly who everybody in here would want, they're going to have to be dealing with uh, line police who are used to doing things a certain way, who their entire careers have been built on certain incentives, um, and even people in the community who are used to expecting police to arrest people when they complain about them. So, like, what do you guys foresee as some of the issues that even the ideal commissioner might be coming into, and how could they either be avoided or ideally gotten in front of so they don't happen? I'll just say quickly, you probably have a better answer than I do, but um, <clears throat> for me, I know that there, we, we ask people to make these radical changes. We want people to come and champion um, this cause, um, 
but oftentimes when they do, we, we have to recognize the, the opposition and how large that is. And so when we put people in place that, are, that, are, that can actually make that change, it's up to us to support them, knowing that they're going to be going against the FOPs, they're gonna be going against all of these powers that be uh, that don't want to see these changes. And so whether it's people like Larry Krasner or whoever this next uh, commissioner is, if they are doing what we ask them to do, then when they do come against these powers, they need support from us. Not, and, and it might not just be everybody you know, from a grassroots level, but those, those individuals who have influence and, and clout in the city um, that, that are champions for this cause need to be able to speak up uh, and support those that are doing the work because there is a ton of opposition. So the next commissioner needs to use all the tools that are available to that person, including data, right? We collect information on every police stop that is used. And in the course of our litigation against the police department, we take all of that data and we turn it into reports and we turn it back to the police and we say, hey, look, in the ninth district, you have a problem, which is that in the whitest neighborhoods, you're stopping mostly black people. What's that about? They shouldn't have needed us to do that data crunch and give it back to them. They have all that data. The police commissioner should be dedicated to taking a hard look at what's going on, looking at the numbers, looking at the facts and saying, why is this happening? It shouldn't take an outside organization to point out what's going on within your police department. Take some responsibility in there, dig it out, and confront it. Yeah. I would say I know our office, uh, our police accountability unit takes that very same data, analyzes it, spits out reports, and, and allows us to see not just what's happening on the you know, big picture level, but granularly. And so the things that we're seeing, there needs to be an independent oversight board that is analyzing this data and doing the very same things. But there needs to be more transparency about what's going on once that, that alarm is rung. So if you know that Officer X is stopping someone 1,400 times, and they are only finding things on someone 2% of those times, that office is not good for that community. What are we gonna do about it? Are we not gonna transfer them? Are they gonna stay and do that and terrorize the community? Because guess what, they're not gonna solve any crimes. They don't trust them. Those residents don't trust that person. You have demoralized people to the point where they don't feel like they belong or, or are free to live in their neighborhoods. So how do I trust you to, to, to work with me to solve something? Two, uh, disciplinary practices, are almost non-existent. And if they are existent, we don't know about it. You know, you make a complaint or things happen, police can't even testify in court and they're still on the force making arrests. So when they can't do their daily function, it's not just what happens outside, but what's brought into the system. If you are so ridden with uh, malicious behavior, uh, in, uh, where your credibility has been stripped from you and you can't even testify based on an arrest you made, why are you still here? What are you doing for us? You're, you're making us pay for you. We're probably paying out lawsuits, civil lawsuits. But for the most part, you're not doing anyone a service in terms of public safety. Because I don't care what side I'm on in terms of my career, I want to feel safe in my city as well. And so that's something that I think we need to make sure that our commissioner is um, steadfast, transparency and accountability. And there needs to be an, an independent oversight board to analyze the data and make some changes when it's necessary. So we're winding down a bit because we had to cut this panel a little shorter than we hoped. So um, I want to throw one last question to you all um, before we get to the next parts of it. And, I, and basically just some quick last thoughts from you all about the upcoming commissioner's post. Basically like what do you think should be the main priorities for specifically addressing the kind of over-policing that we see in which people don't feel free to live in their neighborhoods and, and you know, feel like they have a kind of invading force where they live? Um, and also, what are kind of the most important things that we should be looking for specifically in a candidate on that front? I would like a police commissioner who says the era of quote unquote broken windows policing is over. We are policing for community safety, not whether you're jaywalking. Let's just get rid of that whole notion and go back to understanding what it takes to actually make a community safe and work with the community to figure that out. The different communities, 
just get rid of broken windows policing? I want a commission that doesn't just say what they're going to do, that is actually done uh, culture change in major organizations and really address the behaviors from within. And we're not afraid to do what's necessary to weed out, if you want to call it bad apples or bad policing tactics, and call it out. Um, I also want a commissioner that has the experiences and the understanding that it takes to understand these sensitivities that we're talking about, because some people may get it from their vantage point, but they didn't get it from their experience, their childhood, their, the, the um, lives of the people that they know and love, that they understand those intersectionalities so well that they can really work on it and be intentional. So I don't want someone that just interviews well, someone that actually has proven and walked the walk. That's what I think that we should be looking for. No, I think they, they covered it. I think the biggest thing, you know, as somebody who watches that position, and you, you want to know that that person is on the community side, not just by the words that they say, but by the actions that they do and the transparency that they have, knowing that this is a sensitive situation, uh, knowing that there is, you know, a, a break between that trust um, and going the extra mile to make sure that the community knows uh, that things are being done, that police are being held accountable, that there is an entire culture shift in the way that we go about policing in Philadelphia. So we've um, reordered the program a bit, and so what we're gonna do now is um, we're gonna hear from the mayor's office with some updates about the situation, and then we're gonna go back to um, questions from you all with both these panelists and the ones before. Uh, before, we, before we do that, I just wanna remind everybody here and watching, this is all about you and your community, so make sure that your voice is heard and that you use the hashtag the hashtag, hear Philly speak. Um, so thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Keir. Thank you, Mary Catherine. And we're going to hear from the mayor's office. Thank you all. And I just want to say thank you to Malcolm Jenkins and the Players Coalition for hosting this and all the panelists um, for this conversation. Uh, obviously, the mayor feels that we've made a lot of progress. Um, but we've increased diversion and school diversion programs. We've decreased the use of force. Uh, we've reduced our prison population, uh, reduced pedestrian stops, and implemented anti-racism and implicit bias training. But clearly, from everything we heard tonight, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have to improve our, and increase our accountability. Um, part of that is going to be through the FOP contract, and it is something that we are committed to trying to negotiate through that contract. We have to decrease our car, stop, car, car stops. We recognize that we still have problems. We have to improve community relations, improve diversity in hiring, and tackle the gender bias that is within our own department. And as the next commissioner takes, takes his or her role, uh, those are big issues to, to try and tackle. Uh, the police commissioner search has begun. It's a targeted national search that the police executive research forum is assisting with. We're going to be interviewing a number of internal and external candidates. And those interview panels will be made up of a diverse group of city staff. Now, the ultimate decision will be made by the mayor. Um, but we have started a survey process for community input uh, that we use to develop questions. Those surveys were handed out this uh, tonight. Certainly ask you to, to fill it out, complete it. Uh, there's a box back there. Uh, we will certainly collect it. Um, we expect the entire process to be a wrap up by the end of the calendar year. Uh, you know, we recognize that this process uh, is not going to be exactly what everybody wants. You know, the confidentiality that is going to be required uh, is important. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to gain national, uh, national candidates. Um, this also has to have a specific and special relationship with the mayor. Um, and it is something that the mayor takes very seriously, hearing your concerns. Um, and we're looking forward to this event tonight. Um, I'm from 8th and Diamond, a community in North Philadelphia that has been um, gentrified, and it is now Temple University. And I think that in the years that it took for it to become the community that it is becoming now, I've kind of witnessed the dwindling of my community. Um, and in certain classes that we're taking um, here, sociological classes that we're taking here, it is sort of the understanding that the police are acting on behalf of the interests of the rich and the powerful and not the people of the communities that they serve. And we see that the incarceration of these people is basically to make room for a new development. 
And so I don't exactly expect for any of you to answer questions concerning capitalism or the changing of those structures. But I do want to know how you plan to or how the police plan to address uh, pipelines such as the school to prison pipeline that affect children from these communities and from these school systems and basically invest in their futures as prisoners and not in professions um, to where we can see things like revitalization for our communities coming from people like us. Um, so, and then also I wanted to know what steps will Philadelphia be taking towards harm reducing policy, uh, policing instead of uh, the, the, the kind that we see right now, which is the criminalization. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to know that if we could, this is multi-tiered, and then you also have the opportunity to answer these questions. Um, and then I wanted to know, is this an opportunity for people who are in social work to be at the front line of these problems, such as like we spoke about with mental health or things that don't necessarily cause for like harsh punishment? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a, first, uh, a first bite. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. Our police department um, has played a, played a role in, um, in the school to prison pipeline, right? And how are we gonna correct that? Now we've done a couple of things. One, we launched a school diversion program, which has been uh, fairly successful in keeping uh, high school students from going to jail directly directly from, from high school, just like Meek Mill was, was speaking about. We've also la launched a police-assisted diversion program that takes some minor offenses, like uh, drug offenses and prostitution, and um, before they even enter into the court system, uh, they're allowed to go through a diversion program. Now, those are small programs at this point, but we clearly have to, to, to broaden those programs. Yeah. They're not enough, um, but they, are, they have been started, I think, uh, and I hope that the next commissioner will certainly continue that work as we go forward. I want to touch on the social service professionals that you talked about. I think what this city needs is more social service professionals that really deal with some of the social issues that we are facing because I keep seeing prison guards deal with it and I don't think that they're well equipped to deal with those like those who go to school, learn the craft, and then come out and want to help people. I have a daughter right now who graduated in, with sociology and psychology. She can't find a job. Why? Because we don't have those professions or those opportunities available in even even though we need it desperately. So I think we need a paradigm shift. Um, are we going to employ more police officers when we have these issues, social issues, or are we going to be utilizing those who are trained to deal with these in a way that will make our society much better? Mm -hmm. And so I think that whoever is in charge with that and looking at where we need to deploy our social services, the courts, um, put them in the police departments. Whatever that is, deploy them where we, ha we know we have the people coming in and that we know that those professionals can identify those issues and look for solutions. So, National rhetoric dissuades people from, national rhetoric dissuades people from going into social work because it says that we cannot make money if we do that. So if you have opportunities to create jobs for those I'm people, sorry, we, we should. We have a lot of folks waiting for questions and we have very limited time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I don't. Uh, my name is Minister Paul Weeks, and I have my church at 10th and Rockland, but we need extra police force. It's a lot going on in our community of Logan. Uh, I also want to just say that um, I want to thank the panelists. It, it must be a partnership, faith-based faith Dr. Wilder, G. Lamar Stewart, uh, with the leadership uh, Mayor Kenny and the DA's office, you guys have to find a way to work in unity because I believe this is a watershed moment. I believe we can shift the paradigm as this young lady has said because everybody in here has to be a part of the solution. Anybody in these seats right now who just didn't come for the fan and the fit, fanfare, they are a part of the solution. So I'm going to take what I've learned from all of you with your, um, you know, having your sacrifice, your important time. And moving forward, um, a personal uh, thank you to Malcolm because uh, I was very impressed how you used your platform tonight thank and you. your intellect, but also how you stood up um, against somebody who came against you and how you used your platform to be very eloquent and telling people that lying faces, smiling faces, and you came against that very eloquently. So I thank you and, uh, and, and congratulations on the win.
Hi, um, I just want to first start and say that um, I'm glad, Malcolm, you came and put this together. I was in jail uh, for a petty crime the same time Meek was in jail uh, for being stopped uh, for a bottle of alcohol on New Year's Eve. And I watched that Super Bowl from a jail cell behind that until I was able to bail myself out. So thanks for putting this together and it's just uh, come to fruition, you know what I mean, the interest that I have in, in what, you, what you put together. But the question I want to uh, put out there to all the panels out there is uh, I heard a lot of rhetoric going on about things and racism seems to be the biggest problem, if you ask me. And my question, uh, if you can give me an answer, especially the mayor's assistant, uh, with these police that are races over 300 that Solomon then helped expose uh, through his, uh, you know, through his what he's been doing. Have you ever considered maybe when these officers come in to be uh, police officers, perhaps maybe a, a reference like an ethnic reference? Like if you can't give me two black people. Uh, and you don't know new to, I don't want you in my neighborhood. You, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying consider it. Have you ever considered it? Probably not. But it might be something worthwhile when you look at over 300 officers are racist. And have, had they been held accountable beforehand, it's too late afterwards. Perhaps if you had said on that application that I have to, when I fill out the application, it said, do you got any references? Why not say, do you have any references or ethnic references because with the job that they're doing, they're dealing with the public. It's not racism, they're dealing with the public. Black, white, Chinese, Asian, whatever you want. So I'm just saying consider that because maybe that'll help defeat the problem before they're out on the street. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we've got time for maybe two I more. I got a suggestion. Uh, I mean, you could ask them to, to name two people they know who are from an ethnic group they're not part of. Or you could ask them, to give one example of a time when they called out a peer on doing something wrong. Because the culture in our police office, our police department is not going to change until police officers start turning to one another and saying, that's not funny. Good evening, y'all. My name is Michael Loon. I'm a current student here at the CCP, uh, Community College of Philadelphia, where um, I wanted to thank uh, Reverend Stewart for being here tonight, and thank you, uh, Malcolm Jenkins. Um, education saves my life every day. Um, as a suicide and a gunshot victim survivor, being a part of uh, the streets and what Philadelphia turns into because there are no resources for young, black, Hispanic men, minority men, um, the importance of education is so powerful for me um, because the moment we understand the systems that are in place to oppress us is the moment we can empower ourselves with the knowledge and equip ourselves with the knowledge to be a part of the turnaround. Rather than just have a conversation of what needs to change, we actually can be the change. So I understand that, uh, Malcolm, you're on uh, the board here, um, which thank you for your involvement. Um, Mr. Stewart, you've seen me from Mr. Stewart personally knows me from my journey of where I was at, and I wanted to ask you, Mr. Stewart, and um, anyone else who has a power to understand the importance of education, what is being done around um, funding for education rather than just police brutality or crime? Because that is all a system that is designed to take away from the understanding of knowledge and education in itself. So what is being done to fund public schools, community college of Philadelphia, and the portal to being educated. I, I don't think anybody up here is gonna disagree with you more. Right? That's why uh, the mayor looked to take to local control back, to take responsibility of the school district. That's why we've invested over $300 million in the public school system. That's why we're investing in the community college. And quite frankly, I'd love to see uh, figure out a way to, to offer uh, Redu further reduce tuition to community college. Um, education is the future. If we can't educate our kids, we ain't ever gonna get out of the challenges we're facing. And that's, that, this, that has been the primary pillar of what, what Mayor Kenny stands for. So we unfortunately have time for only one more question. Sure. Uh, and I encourage you all to tweet out the rest of your questions as we I'm said earlier. Asking. I know you all were running late already. She gonna ask a question and I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> Ma'am. Well, hello. Good evening. My name is Kiana. I'm the student government president here, and I'm also a student. So um, I was more so, I would say, like a question and a comment. So March the 11th, 2019, I was assaulted by a Caucasian police officer, male. 
um, a routine traffic stop. I went on yellow. He walked up to the vehicle. He flashed the light in my face. I put my hands up. He grabbed my arm and he broke it. I asked for a sergeant and an ambulance because I'm a 12-year fireman, so I know the protocol. I was told we got one or two ways we're going to do this. If you go that route, you're going to be arrested, suspicion of a DUI. I said, I'm not drunk. He said, well, you got to prove that when you go down. And I was like, well, if I was assaulted by a regular male and not a police officer, what's the process? And they told me this is different. So the next day I went to the 12th district and I asked to file a complaint and I was told by the captain, we don't do that here. I went to IAB, I filed a complaint. Start As of today, no outcome. He's still on the street. If you assault a woman, there was another female in the car with me. That's your regular behavior. So for him to be still employed with the police department and as a fireman, I already know it's a brotherhood. The IAB are, for, are previous police officers. They're never gonna do nothing. It's a good old boys club. So I know my complaint isn't gonna go anywhere, but women are gonna continue, anybody. As a, as a civil service employee, your job is not to be out here assaulting people. I went on yellow, give me a ticket. But instead he broke my arm, I was handcuffed. When I asked to go to the hospital, from eighth and race, they took me to Einstein. My pressure was 200 over 100. That's a stroke alert, you're supposed to go to the first hospital. I passed two hospitals to get to another one because they wanted to cause me inconvenience because I was pressing charges. So to the mayor's office, what, what are you guys doing opposed to continuing with panels that are not going anywhere? And the police academy, they, are, they get the 10, per, the 10 extra points when you take the test. So if you get an 80, you automatically get a 90 because you were in the military. And we all know predominantly what race is in the military. So what are we doing to stop this? Because at the end of the day, it's like a blue car pulling up with rednecks. So for, first, I, I'm sorry that you ha that happened to you, and I, I would like to get at least the information so I can track down exactly where that case is and, and, and be able to move forward. But I, I think your larger question is, what are, how are we holding police officers accountable through uh, internal affairs? How are we holding police accountable uh, through the citizen uh, complaints against police process? Um, and, you know, I think I, I said it in my, my remarks and flew by them, but we have to do better. Um, we're going to need to, we're going to need different provisions in our FOP contract. Um, and we're going to need to, uh, we're going to need to be able to, to uh, be brave and have some courage to tackle some of those issues. That's going to be hard, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to be able to have an FOP contract in, in January. That's going to be perfect. It's not, going to, it's not going to make everybody on this panel happy, but I hopefully can make some progress. <clears throat> um, that's not, you know, these are deep-seated cultural issues that the next commissioner is going to have to tackle. Um, that's why we are, are being thoughtful in our approach. Um, this is not just about community relations. It's not just about racism. It's not just about gender bias. Uh, it's, it is about, and it's not just about violence in our community. It's about all of those things together in a department that's in crisis. And w the next commissioner is going to have to tackle those, those issues together. Thank you. And we'll throw it to Malcolm for a, Let's get a couple, more. couple more questions. Malcolm says there. Cool. On so uh, my name is Kamal Shale. I am a, a member of Philly for Real Justice. We are the original police abolitionists in Philadelphia. We started right after uh, Mike Brown. Uh, his killer was not indicted, and we all came out to the streets. The entire community of Philadelphia came out to the streets, came together, and formed this coalition, which then eventually became the organization we have now. And I want to know, when are we going to start taking money from the police? Because we just heard this whole, it's like been two hours of all these problems the police have, of how they don't work, of how they hurt people, of how they break arms, and no one can report them, and we can't seem to get a hold of this. And they, they, then we want to talk about giving them more money for some police advisory council. When we first came together, we tried that. We tried to protect whistleblowers. We tried to infiltrate the system. We tried all the stuff you're talking about. There was a DOJ report that came out like 14, 15 that said everything you people are saying. There's a report just a couple weeks ago that said that uh, communities with more black people you stop and frisk and traffic stops to generate money. This stuff is constant and ongoing, and I'm so tired of hearing people get shot in their damn house, of hearing people get murdered in the street, and I have to hear about it from the police, 
And then you want to tell me it's my fault. It's our fault. Our community's in crisis. We're dealing with all these problems. It's us, right? Right, so we got a bunch of cops doing nothing but arresting us, pushing us into more poverty that creates poverty. You literally put people in a position where they can't get a job, right? Where they on probation for years, and they got to pay for that? That's money out of our pockets. You're robbing us blind, telling us our fault, beating us, brutalizing, and killing us. So I want to know, right, we already know education fixes at least some of that. I want to know who is going to take money away from the police. There is a billion dollars in that system right now between the police and the prison system. A billion dollars or more. Why, why don't we have that in our school? Why are we still constantly, why is there a tax for, for sodas so we can pay for a preschool where you have a billion dollars based on people arresting us and messing us up. I'm trying not to curse. I'm really trying not to curse. But, I mean, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I'm, I'm upset that I had to wait this long, that we had to sit through all this, that we had to hear people talk about how, like, well, we do see the problem, but, you know, I don't know what to do about it. We know what to do about it. We have tons of answers. You talked about uh, organizations already doing some of this work. Why aren't we funding them more? Why are we giving more money to the police? So that's my question. How can we take money from the police and give it to the community? Who wants to take the financial? Can, I'll jump in. Um, I appreciate all that you said, and I've just got a little bit to add, but a little bit is better than nothing. So let me tell you my personal experience. I made a comment in response to one of the questions a little while ago about the overtime um, and cops wanting to get hired and make $150,000 a year plus. I didn't say, but I've heard a lot about a lot of them having nice homes on the Jersey Shore, and all of this stuff bothers me too. And one thing we're doing in the office is we're trying to at least stop some of that. And what I'm referring to is there has been this culture for years of where the cops have a bit of a cash cow in terms of how they get subpoenas to show up to court. Um, they get overtime. It's crazy. And we've discovered that a lot of times the system for when they get subpoenaed is being controlled by them, not us, the prosecutors. We have been arguing about that now for months. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, wait a minute. The prosecutor's the person who ought to be deciding who should be coming to court to testify as witnesses, not the cops. Let us do it. And we're not going to subpoena you just because you want to make overtime. We're going to subpoena you because we think you are a needed witness and, and as important, a credible witness, one that we trust we're going to put up on the stand and is going to tell the truth. We're just starting to chip away. But I think it's a good start, and hopefully that will help some in terms of the culture. And too often, some cops thinking making money is more important than what they took their job for. I, I just want to say, too, I think officers should be held um, responsible for their own civil uh, liabilities. So when someone is getting a... The city shouldn't have to pay for their misconduct all the time. They should, it should come out of their pocket. I mean, how that, however that happens, it should happen. One more? Yeah. Thank y'all for uh, putting this together. Tracy Jones, uh, Executive Director of the T. Alexander Foundation. We use sports as a tool to educate. Um, so as a nonprofit director, most of the nonprofits and social services are also often tasked with bridging gaps and providing solutions and being innovative in the community. Since we're talking so much tonight about trauma, transparency, and training, why not um, really center the next search around, as the sister uh, stated, the next commissioner being a social worker to handle the power dynamics, the intersectionality, and the cultural proficiency that's needed to address each rank and file within not only the police force, but also within the mayor's office and the community. Because typically and traditionally how most commissioners rise up the rank is through that law and order method. If we're saying that system is broken and we continue to pick out apples from that rotten batch, why not just go outside of it and be innovative like we salute in the backdrop some of the companies that are building in our city um, and be more intentional about providing those services rather than saying, we're just gonna put someone in there and then outsource all those other resources. 
Cool. Everybody's looking at me, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the characteristics that a social worker um, brings to a department is going to be important, but I also think um, managing a uniform presence um, is going to take more than just a social worker. And so we're going to have to figure out what that balance is. And I do think that we can in insert more social work in policing. I think we can pair up our police officers with social workers today, which we actually already do in, in some of our homeless services, um, as well as some of the work that we're doing in Kensington. Um, but I think running the fifth largest, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth largest um, police department is gonna take experience, and they're gonna, uh, folks are gonna need to have experience in patrol, they're gonna need to understand uh, the challenges and, uh, and the safety demands upon them uh, personally, um, but they're also gonna need to figure out how to bring that social work and that community bias with them. And so I think I, that is absolutely a lens we're looking at, but just putting a social worker into that position, um, I, you know, I, I think we're going to need a law enforcement prof professional with a social work, back, uh, social work bent. If I could say one thing, um, I appreciate everybody's reflections tonight, but, but there is one thing that you can do uh, that can make a difference. A lot of this can live when the body politic is not involved and invested. Um, people can get away with corruption if they know they can't be voted out, if they know that there's no power over them. What's coming up uh, for us next year, uh, number one, is the census. Uh, we are an undercounted community, and if you are not counted in the census, that is money that we're looking for for uh, various pieces in our community that won't come from the federal level unless you are counted. Number two, being registered to vote and involved. What is stronger than the FOP is a community that puts pressure on their political officials that know they'll get voted out if they don't start serving you. And I know that's rhetoric, and I know that lots of us are tired. We're hearing that the vote makes a difference. But the truth of the matter is, we have not turned out at the polls since Obama. Uh, and so since we don't turn out in the polls, then those who are supposed to represent us don't necessarily care. They only care where they see people really participating. And so I want to encourage you to know that next year, two things that you can do is make sure you're counted in the census, number one. Number two, make sure that you register to vote. Only 7% of the public funding for public education is funneled through the fair, for, fair um, student weighted f uh, funding formula. The only way that will change is people involved politically. We're not getting the money in Philadelphia that we deserve. We're not getting the money to our children that we deserve. And the only way we'll get it is people who have stood up to be counted, who are voting and who are present and involved. So I just want to encourage that because there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done, but the pressure has to come from you. Uh, one more. Malcolm, some closing remarks. <clears throat> um, obviously, you know, this is a, a topic that is near and dear to a lot of people that, that came. We appreciate everybody for showing up. Um, you know, obviously with time constraints, not everybody can be heard, but we encourage you to continue to speak up, continue to ask uh, your, your questions, use the hashtag, uh, continue to be active, whether it be in, in elections, in your communities. Um, we'll continue to kind of lift this uh, burden and put pressure on those that have the power to, to actually make the changes that we want to see. Um, <clears throat> they start with hard conversations like this, but uh, it's up to us to continue to put these things in action and support those uh, who have been doing the work for a long time. So uh, I know for me, uh, I, I really appreciate everybody's participation and showing out tonight. I thank all the panelists for being here, uh, giving us your time and your, your insight. Um, and we hope that we continue to just push this forward to make Philly something or somewhere we can all be proud to be, uh, you know, citizens of. Thank you.